Okay, this is Jim Groom on DTLT Today, and I have the pleasure, as you can see to my right, to introduce Valerie LaPointe, who's a student here at Mary Washington, who also works um, or writes for The Bullet, which is Mary Washington student paper, and we'll talk about that in a second. But how I know Valerie first and foremost, as is an awesome blogger, and she blogged her whole study abroad experience in Australia, and Valerie, welcome to DTLT today. And can you talk to us a little bit about your awesome blogging in Australia? Um, well, it started as just a project to keep my mom up with what I was doing because very, she had very maternal concerns about me being halfway around the world and not knowing what I was up to or if I was going to be okay. So she was like, I need to keep up with you somehow. Um, so I was going to do the blog, and then I found out that I could get experiential learning credit for it at Mary Washington, which is a requirement that you need to graduate, that you can get via internship or other experience. But if you study abroad, you can keep a blog and use it towards that requirement. So it just started out like that, and then I just really got into it, and I enjoyed doing it so much. It actually ended up being included as part of the promotional package for the study abroad provider that I went with. Um, so I... It, my, I got a lot of pressure from my mom to keep it going. If I went longer than a couple days without doing it, she would say, hey, haven't seen anything up on the blog recently. So I tried to keep up with it. I, I think I averaged about four or five posts a week. So that's yeah, you're amazing. And it. I have to give full credit to your mom because pushing you to do it was a wild kind of documentary about your process. I mean, the images underwater of the turtles, which we used. It's a header mast. I mean, you had some beautiful photos of just sharks. And I mean, it was amazing. I can't take credit for all of that. Some of some of my pictures um, I stole from friends, and uh, towards the end of my trip, my whole family went on with me, and so I compiled. We had four different cameras, so I compiled all the pictures from the best of all four, and put them into my iPhoto and and picked what I wanted. So not all the pictures were taken by me. Well, but most it was amazing, of them were. and I just want to do one last thing about your your blogging, which I just thought was stupendous. Is I really associated deeply with your dad when he was excited to see the Mad Max car. And you were like, you know, here he is checking oh, out yeah. the Mad Max car. I mean, for me, that would be the only reason to go to Australia, is to see the Mad Max to car. To see the Mad Max car? <laughs> well, a lot of people that went to the study in New Zealand were really excited because they were filming The Hobbit while the semester was over there. And if you had uh, a New Zealand visa during that time and you met certain height requirements, you could stand in as an extra, as either an elf or a, um, a dwarf wow. or a hobbit. So that was really exciting for some of the kids that went to New Zealand. If you were just visiting, a lot of my friends who were in Australia that went just went to visit couldn't do it. But I actually met people while I was in Thailand that were studying in New Zealand, and they got to stand in as extras. So they got to be cool. hobbits. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you meet a certain health, uh, a height requirement, like I would not have been able to be a hobbit. I would have had to be an elf because I'm like 5'11". Yeah. So that wouldn't well, have flown, that's similar. But... I'm about 6'1", so I would have had to be either an elf or a Gandalf or something, right? Yeah. How big is Gandalf? Yeah. I don't know. He must be. I don't know. It's hard to tell because he's always standing next to the hobbits right. and they're really short. So you don't really ever <laughs> get a good a gauge good on that. So now, you contact me today and then I kind of framed you by putting you on TV and I apologize. You're a great sport. Okay. But you okay. um, contacted me about the Times Higher Education article about UMW Blogs. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Okay. And mm -hmm. I am all ears, all questions. You let me know any questions you might have and I'll see if I can fill in any details um, that I might provide? Well, uh, we're looking to do an article for this, about for the paper, and we kind of just wanted to delve into what they were talking about in terms of, you know, this being a pioneering thing, because people that are my age, and I'm a senior this year, um, when I started as a freshman, my freshman seminar class, we yeah. had a blog. So I came into college thinking, oh, this is just what you do in college. We just have blogs, and we have a blog website associated with the school, and this is completely normal, and 
you know, everyone does this. This is not abnormal at all. And then it was cool to read this article and say, oh, well, this this isn't normal. This is actually something that UMW is pioneering and, and doing in a really unique way. And I thought that article highlighted yeah. it really well. And since it is kind of your brainchild and your baby, uh, kind of wanted to talk to you about, you know, why the concept behind this when it was first started, how you've seen it grow. Um, obviously, you must be such a proud father <laughs> to be reading this and have somebody saying, oh, yes, your, your kid is doing a good job. It's getting all A's. Well, you frame it beautifully. Uh, UMW has, has worn well on you. Um, I mean, it's cool. I mean, it's cool, A, to see, hear that you have, was a, you were a freshman and you were using a blog. And for you, it just seemed like, oh, wait, that's going to be part of my college experience. And in many ways, it has been. Um, and for me, I think that's cool because the blog, as we imagined it, and it wasn't just me, it was the whole uh, Division of Teaching and Learning Technologies group, Martha Burtis, Andy Rush, now Tim Owens, Lisa Ames, and Gardner Campbell when he was here, as well as Pat Patrick Gossetti Murray. So there are many people who are part of that. But what's really cool is to think that our initial idea that the students would have a space where they reflect and kind of collate and curate the work they're doing as college students with the idea that hopefully they will bring it with them. And this will be part of a kind of ongoing discourse, discussion, framing of who they are, both as scholars and as people. And that we provide them a space in this kind of context of learning and teaching that they can start that conversation and hopefully have a community that gives them feedback on their interests, on things they like. I mean, that's why I was so intrigued by your blog when you were in Australia, is that you really were you talking about the things that interested you and the, the focuses you had in both on a daily life, so it wasn't only your schooling, but that also reflects on who you are as a person and who you are as a UMW student and as a thinker. And I thought like this would be an authentic space where students could really kind of frame who they are as thinkers. And often what you'll realize is these spaces are actually web natives. They live on the web. When people search for your name, if you didn't block it, they'll find you. And this idea of being discovered as a UMW student and having a kind of frame and a portfolio right out of the box where we can feature the work we're doing here, I thought was just an amazing kind of approach to giving every student their own space to kind of control and to build upon as part of their process here, but well beyond that. The thing about Blackboard and LMSs in general that I hate is when you do anything in them, Valerie, like anything you put in them, by the end of the semester, you either have to save it independently or it's gone. Well, the idea of UMW Blogs is the absolute opposite. You control how long it stays there, who sees it, and what happens to it ultimately when you leave. It's fully in your control, and it's your space to be the admin of. And I think, to me, it's a moment that Gardner Campbell talks about, like making you the sysadmin of your education, making you in full control of the work you've done, and hopefully to bring it with you as you go. So I do think it's cool, and UMW Blogs was not the first – uh, blogging platform um, in higher ed, but what it was was it was the first one that basically put no limits on the student or the faculty. It just said, look, we trust you. We believe that this is kind of an experiment that as adults in higher education we can handle and just go crazy with it. Show us what's possible. And that's what I love about UMW is all the folks from faculty to students to staff did. And it really became the experiment not because of Jim Groom's brainchild, but because the UMW community really engaged it. That was the real difference. Well, speaking from a personal experience, um, when I knew I, was, I knew I was gonna study abroad, I knew I was gonna do a blog. So one of the first things I did was I got on UMW blogs and I clicked through all the different ones that were already there under the study yeah. abroad header. And I looked at people that were already in the countries that I was looking at going to. And I actually was able to shoot them some comments and say, hey, you know, I see that you did this. What was this like? Or how's the weather? Or how do I, you know, tackle the problem of getting a visa? And I was able to have a dialogue with them based That's on what awesome. they had written. Um, and similarly, that was, well, that was what inspired me to do a blog through a UMW blogs as opposed to just like a regular blog or a platform or a regular WordPress platform. Um, because I wanted to be a resource to other students who were thinking about studying abroad because it's a really daunting thing to take on initially. And I know I had dozens of questions, not just about the formal aspects of how do you get there and, and what are all the semantics that go into it, but just what it was going to be like from a person, like on a day to day kind of thing. And it was cool that I was able to reach out to people that had posted yeah. already. 
And additionally, um, while I was abroad, it wasn't just people that, like my mom, my family that commented, but I actually got some comments from professors. Um, I think the header on my blog was the wonderful world of Oz um, travels in Fiji, Australia, and Thailand theoretically to study. Because to me, studying abroad is not really about <laughs> studying, it's about traveling. I mean, I could stay here and study. Why the heck do I need to go half around the world to do that? So a professor, I, I think it was a geography professor, um, commented and said something like, I really enjoyed your header because I always emphasize to students that it's it really is about enjoying the country and you are there to study, but that should be a secondary thing to really getting the most out of the country that you're in. Yeah. So it was just cool to be in dialogue with the rest of the MW community while I was over there. And people were able to find me really easily yeah. um, through UMW blogs. I was blocked on search engines while I was over there. I've unblocked it since, but... But I, um, yeah, it was just cool that I was able to kind of be involved in that dialogue and still have like a plug into campus and other things that were going on, even though I was halfway yeah, around I love the world. That. And you're a poster child, really, for what's possible. And A, I love that you could decide whether you block the search or not. That should be your decision. That shouldn't be ours. And I also love that other faculty and students are reading it, but you're reading other faculty and students' work to get tips. I mean, there's a very practical part of this. We have this kind of technology that makes sharing this stuff easy. Why aren't we using it in a way that kind of bolsters our community? And I think everything you said really just reinforces that this needs to be a tool about community. And what's amazing is that the Times Higher Education article is like, no one else is doing this. You know, UMW is really the only yeah. one doing it with any real kind of authentic push for community and having faith in the students and faculty. And I think that's a real crisis that so few schools. Well, that was a big wake up moment for me because, you know, I, was, I studied abroad my junior year, which is the year everybody yeah. goes. And a lot of my other friends had study abroad blogs and they were hosted on platforms I never heard of. They were places that were yeah. hard to find. And I said, oh, doesn't, you know, why don't you use your school website? Yeah, and they're like, exactly. what? That's a... we, we, don't, we don't have one of those. What are you talking about? And this to me was a breakthrough. I just thought, like like I said, it came in my freshman year thinking, oh, this is college. Obviously, we have a blog website associated with us. Obviously, teachers use this for, you know, classroom activities. It never occurred to me that this was abnormal or this was extraordinary in any way. And my junior year, I, you know, came to start, I started to see that, that that was abnormal. And this was something really cool that we were doing. And, and it raised some of those questions for me as well. Like, why, why wouldn't you do this? This seems to make yeah. sense. This works on a really functional level. It allows you to engage with the community, not only academically, but in lots of other ways. So yeah. why not? <laughs> I think you need to be the spokesperson for UMW blogs now. That's all I know now. <laughs> What's more, though, is you know the fact that very few people that you met overseas, and very few people here, um, you know, in Virginia or local colleges or even beyond, they're not doing this. And I think the problem they're not doing this is a crisis of IT in a lot of these institutions, but also a crisis of faith in the faculty and in the in the students. And I think if we can frame UMW, which I think it is, as a place that has faith in the students and faith in the faculty enough so that they have open discourse about what we're doing, I think it really attests to the quality and the mission of our university. That's something I really believe in. <coughs> Excuse me. I took, I took a communications class where our teacher filmed us and put our videos of us being filmed, uh, videos of our presentations on our blog yeah. website. And then invited the rest of the class to comment and give suggestions. And typically, you know, if you are in a speech class like that and you miss the day that whoever's talking gives their yeah. speech, that's it. Game over. But he was able to preserve that and he now uses it for other classes. And if anyone is asking, if anyone approaches me and they're like, oh, I really need a speaking intensive class. I'm thinking about taking this. What do you think? I'm like, go get on the blog website. Like, go look exactly. at it. See what people are saying about it. And it's been a way for me to check up on other classes. Like, is this going to be interesting? I can go check out the blog and see if people are engaging in a lively discussion and and kind of engage the student response without having it be filtered because i mean there are more formal ways of going about you know assessing whether a course would be interesting you can read the course catalog you can talk to professors but you're going to get really dry pr yeah. answers you're not going to get <laughs> what the real experience is that was my the same thing i felt when i was looking at studying abroad i didn't want a dry pr answer i didn't want to go to the study abroad rep and say what's this going to be like because obviously they're just yeah. going to sell it to you and make it out to look like it's going to be disney world and so i wanted i wanted the real brass tacks of what it was going to be like and and that was how i got it it was unfiltered and i was able to ask questions and that was and i love that you're doing that and 
you know, the fact that people might be using this space because it's courses, you have that, but it's a whole lot of other space things that we never predicted. Like the study abroad blogs came about because I read a lot and I kind of go through the UMD blogs. I feel I feel like I'm kind of the gardener. Like I go through just to make sure that, you know, no one's getting crazy, which never really happens. And just everything's kind of on board. Like no one's getting... Well, and you fixed my RSS yeah, feed problem. Yeah, exactly. It's just a lot of work. Yeah, that's right. I responded to that. But the fact is, is I just think of myself as kind of... I started it. I kind of want to keep it going and, and have some sense of community around it. Well, I started to realize all these people were creating study abroad blogs. And so I just started to ask them, hey, do you mind if I aggregate them in one space so people can see them? And I like 30 blogs later... We had like, you know, a serious community of study abroad blogs that I had to do nothing to kind of push to aggregate in one space. And, you know, in the course of a year, I think we had something like 650 posts from 30 different students who were all over the world, you know, and you were part of that. People that like I have a friend that's doing a graduate program um, that isn't she, like she's a UMW graduate. She's done here, but she's still using yeah. UMW blogs to talk about what she's doing post-graduation. I love it. Awesome. And we have a lot of students. There's an interesting one. If you go to the site Hire Hassan, so H-I-R-E-H-A-S-S-A-N.com, you can map your own domain onto a UMW blog. And so he is using this as a space to apply for graduate schools and also as a portfolio. And he's well done with UMW, but I love that people still find it valuable enough that they keep using it. And I love that, you know, people internationally now are recognizing UMW blogs as a unique platform provided by a school like UMW that, you know, really starts to think about how social media and new publishing forms really do reinforce and augment the traditional notions we have about teaching and learning and community. And I love that these two aren't exclusive, but brought together, they start to bring us into an even more kind of, I mean, I hold on to Pref President Hurley's idea that, you know, if we're going to be the best liberal arts college, whatever that means, um, I think that part of that has to be thinking creatively about what the digital space provides us. Because I don't think the two are exclusive. And I think our students come here for very specific reasons. They want small classrooms. They want an intimate relationship with their professors and the other students they are here with. And we do that well. But how do we use the web to kind of capture that and to share that broadly, given that we're a public school? And UMW Blogs, for me, has been some little bit of success in that way. And I like, I mean, like you said, as a father of the, of the brainchild or whatever, I'm glad to see people say, yes, that's a cool way to do this. And I want to do it now with stuff like we're doing now, TV, radio. Like, I would love for you to be doing a radio show from Australia or a field report on a regular basis when you were in Australia. Like, a way for you to share your experience both in video and in audio as well as images and text um, and really make us kind of like a, a media cooperative where we're sharing out what we do in various places both on campus and beyond. I, yeah, I think that'd be really. That's that's. Like I said, it's just it's amazing to me that nobody else has thought of this yet. It's like one of those ideas that you stumble on. And you're like, oh yeah, this makes sense. People people yeah. will do this. And well, doesn't, doesn't, doesn't I think a lot of people happening. have thought about it, but a lot of people have hit a roadblock in their respective universities that have prevented. And here's the kind of deal. And I know you have to go, Valerie. So you just let me know when you have to go. Just pull the hatch. The deal is. You know, everybody at universities, because they're institutions, are like, you know, someone's going to do this. Someone's going to say this. Some, you know, terrible happenstance is going to happen. So all the negatives are put forward. And that prevents them from ever giving the possibility of that 1% of per, 1% chance of something bad is going to happen to rule out all the 99% of stuff of awesome that can happen. And so what we're benefiting from right now is all the awesome. We've got 99% of awesome stuff happening all over the world, even locally on campus. And then the 1% we're still waiting on. And it might come sooner or later, but I think, you know, aren't we adults? Can't we deal with it if someone drops a, you know, an F-bomb or whatever it is? Like, I think we're adult enough in higher ed to deal with that, you know? Well, and it's, it's separate from the regular website, and I think people understand that it's a viewpoint section yeah. of the university. I mean, you're getting the viewpoint of the individual author. No individual blogger is speaking for the university as a whole on a administrative level. So, I mean, at least coming, like, I'm coming from a journalism background, so to me, a UMW blog's website attached to a regular website is saying, all right, well, 
here's the front page, here's umw.com or .edu. And then here's the viewpoint section of the students. And these views represent the students, not the institution as a whole, but they are representative of how the institution you know, is at a That's grassroots right. level. And I would think that you know, if I were a student looking on the outside looking in, I would want to say, hey, you know, here's an institution that, you know, trusts and encourages students to have their own opinions and to share them without cutting it down or shutting them down. And I think the more we can put the education process back in the hands of the students alongside the faculty, uh, the better off we are as a community. You know, because it's with you and faculty where all this stuff happens. And I want to think our job at DTLT and beyond is to kind of make sure that experience is as cutting edge, innovative and potentially communal as possible. Like, I want to be a part of that community. I don't want to think of myself as some drone in some office that has no part of what happens in the classroom. Like, I want to be part and parcel of helping people do what they do, but do it better. You know? Well, and I was in a journalism class where we did a project that involved um, multimedia and creating a website. And we did that through UMW Blogs. And you actually came in and talked to our class about 25 ways to tell a digital story and different things that we can use to do that. And that experience is invaluable in, in a journalism field or really in any field nowadays because everything is going online. Everyone says newspapers are dying. Well, they're not dying. That's they're right. going online. And to learn how to tell that story and to move that medium online and to be given these tools and not just, you know, given a textbook, oh, this is how you would do it, but to be shown how to do it, to have a platform which you can practice doing it and then have it be preserved so you can go back to it and say, hey, I'm applying to grad school and, you know, I'm going to be asked to use these platforms, but I did that. I, I did that in a class. I need I to ask you, this is, so, and this is purely self-promotion, but I think it has some value in it for you. Are you signed up for DS106 yet? Digital storytelling? Well, I'm graduating. Oh, you're graduating the end of this semester? Yeah. Oh, you'd be perfect. You'd be perfect for DS106. It makes me sad. You sure you don't want to stay around for one more semester? No, I have a full-time job. I have a full-time job waiting for me in January. Well, I had to make the push because everything you're saying about new media, um, content production, thinking about learning for the web is what digital storytelling, a class we teach in computer science 106 really starts to frame students for it has them produce you know video audio uh mashups all this stuff and the idea of telling a story across various modes and using the web and social media to tell these stories it's actually really good and we had the reason i think about it when you talk about journalism is we had a journalism student who took this class and then went for an interview uh in new jersey because she was graduating and a number of the questions they asked like do you have a twitter account um, how do you use Twitter? Um, how do you use X month? I mean, she didn't have any of this stuff before we actually did DS106. She was like, this is rad. You know, you're getting me ready for some practical stuff I'm going to deal with in, uh, in the work world. And I would hope that it's both theoretical and has some practical application. I like the balance of both. Well, I feel like the the fa- like beyond just UMW blogs, the faculty is taking initiative yeah. as well, because obviously in that journalism class, um, which was taught by That's Professor great. McCarthy, he was taking initiative and saying, "Hey, this is where the world of journalism is going. We need to be on top of this." And I took um, a literature class of all things with Who's Zach great. Whalen yeah. um, on world building, which was all about kind of digital digital stories, stuff like The Matrix and Tron, and we were required to have a Twitter account yeah. for the class. And it, I, I'm not sure if he intended us to use it this way, but we were in the lab in Combs where, you, where everyone's sitting at a computer. And so he would start talking about something and he'd be giving a lecture and we'd all be twittering about whatever he was saying. Like, oh, remember that scene in Tron, huh? That was really funny. And so, yes, there was him. He was talking with us. So there was already a dialogue going on with the class and people were raising their hands and asking questions. But those quieter people that maybe wouldn't want to raise their hands were still engaging in the class on Twitter. And we were still having a conversation. And... We had instances where uh, we had a hashtag <laughs> for the class, and my friends would see me hashtagging the, the class constantly, and they would ask me, like, what, what, is, what is this? What are you talking about? And I would get to explain them, and so it, it actually moved beyond the classroom in that way. And we would come for, uh, he had movies that we would have to come see, and he would uh, screen them in combs, and we'd Twitter about it. So if other kids in the class maybe, you know, didn't see the movie or they weren't interested in seeing the movie, you, they'd see us Twitter about it, like, oh, maybe I should check that out. And so it was kind of a way to move out of the class. Yeah, Twitter's really cool. good about that for the network. But you just also make the point about all the other faculty here at Mary Washington that make this experience for you, you know, I think unique. I think what we're doing here at Mary Washington, thinking about how, 
you know, the web and technology integrates into teaching and learning beyond the idea of hardware, but to the idea of like how this is creating a networked world, augmenting teaching and learning is really powerful. And I do, I am proud of what UMW is doing right now. I mean, and I'm glad that you're even asking questions. And fact is, you're not just asking questions. You know, you're a model example of everything that's happening. So it's awesome. Well, and it, like, like I said, it never occurred to me this was unusual. I thought, oh, we're in college. College is supposed to be preparing us for jobs in the workplace. This is the reality of jobs in the workplace nowadays. So if you're not doing this, you're kind of hindering your students because they're going to face this in a couple of years and not know yeah, And I want to think against. we're both marrying the, the practical preparation to some degree because we are liberal arts. So once we say we're too practical, people get scared. But with that kind of notion of, you know, and I think we do this really well, you know, teaching critical, thoughtful, compassionate notions of, you know, humanity alongside the idea that we're becoming a, you know, a hyper technical culture. And with that comes all sorts of questions, not only practical, but also ethical, right? Also, you know, conceptual, um, existential. Like, how does digital identity change that I only knew you through a blog before I actually met you in a class one time? I mean, there's whole sorts of questions that are key to our culture um, that are starting now to be framed on that web space. And I think as an academic, institutional, intellectual um, space, we need to be interrogating that. So even that, I, I agree that it's going to be useful for our students to get jobs, but I think it's key for our culture to be interrogating these spaces as students as faculty, as staff, so that we can make sense of it, you know? It's key. I totally agree. I totally agree. My blog actually, my, my lazier friends who I say are broad with would actually send my blog home to their parents and say, oh, here's what I did. Just That's read this. That's awesome. That's great. <laughs> you were narrating their story. Think about that, you know? Yeah, and then, and then, but it got to the point where they were like, don't write this in the blog. Oh, no. <laughs> like, something would happen. We'd go out and, and things would get crazy and they'd be like, I don't want to see this on the blog So tomorrow. they were censoring you. See? With great power comes great responsibility. <laughs> that's true. Well, that's great. That's true. Well, Valerie. It's like the Spider-Man of the blog. Did I world. even begin to answer any of your questions for this article? Yeah, you did. I did. Yeah, you did. I did need okay. to go to class, though. Well, hey, thank you for being on DTLT today. You're awesome. I think you're our you're first official student guest outside of the DTLT student aides. So congratulations. And also, I will send you the link to DTLT today so you can see how awesome you are um, in the privacy of your own room. On YouTube is where it will be and Blip TV. Okay. All right? Well, thanks so much. Thank you, Valerie. Well, so Take much. care. And thank you, everyone. That will be the end of DTLT today. today. Take care. Thank you.